Hi, I hope you guys are having a, a good morning. Um, I know it's early, and so, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I've already had my three cups of coffee, so almost caffeinated. Um, all right, so today, as you may or may not already know, the topic of the talk is glass hacks. So this is fun and frightening uses of both Google's new wearable computer as well as other always-on devices. So uh, let's, let's just get started. Um, there's a few kind of key concepts and uh, overarching ideas that, um, you know, that, I, that keep coming up when, when, both when I work on these types of problems as well as when I think about this from a higher, higher level. And, and those three things are, one is that we're moving into a world where we're able to collect, as an individual, massive amounts of data. And um, it, it, you'll, you'll start to see th throughout the talk that, that this is becoming increasingly true. So just the, the, the amount of, let's say, uh, megabytes or gigabytes per day that one person can on their own collect has just you know, gone up a lot. Uh, the, the second one is that uh, alongside this increased ability to collect data, um, we have an increased ability as individuals, not just large corporations or, or organizations or institutions, but as individuals to process this data and to do interesting things with it. And um, finally, the question is, well, what does this mean from a privacy perspective? Um, what does this mean from, from the perspective of of uh, how we go and conduct our daily lives even. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history, I'll, I'll keep this, this part brief, um, about wearable computing in general. So there's this guy, Edward Thorpe, who, he wrote a paper in 98 claiming that he was the first one to invent a wearable computer. And uh, th what he was talking about was a small device that fit inside of a shoe and allowed him to do roulette calculations. So he's also pretty famous for coming up with uh, blackjack card counting methods, and um, you know, he, he was actually working with Claude Shannon on this one of, of, you know, of information theory. And so it's kind of interesting. This is 1955. This is a while ago. Um, you know, so the, if you look at the Wikipedia article, Edit History, which is always fun when you're doing research, you know, of course, this was changed, and, and it's actually now now, now solidified that Steve Mann is in fact the inventor because somebody edited on Wikipedia to make sure that the working definition made, made solidified him as the inventor of the wearable computer. And so the, the basic idea, the, 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 the argument I guess they were having was that one's a specific purpose versus one is a general purpose computer. Um, but academic squabbling, oh, surprise. Um, this guy, Steve Mann, how many people have heard of Steve Mann? Okay, good. Um, so Steve Mann deserves his own slide. So even if there is some question as to whether or not he invented the first wearable computer, um, it would be hard to say that he hasn't actually done everything else already. So this man is, is the, the godfather to some degree of wearable computing and uh, being creepy in general. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, I, unfortunately, I can't defend him in that respect. He also did invent HDR, which this is an HDR image. Uh, so he, 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 he's done some really amazing things um, and has kind of lived his life as one big experiment to what happens when you decide to log everything you see? What happens when you decide to wear weird looking things on your body, as we'll come to very soon? Um, so Steve Mann, uh, wearable computer uh, pioneer, I would say. Anyways, that's about it for history. Now let's kind of, let's go on a little bit to, to the, the present. Okay, so if I could get a show of hands, how many people here have, um, have like seen these in person? This is a pair of Google Glass. Okay. So some, uh, so, you know, I, I come from Silicon Valley, so, you know, this is an unfortunately, I see too many of these and, um, uh, but yeah, so here's a pair, and yeah, look, you know, I, I can put it on my face, wow, okay. I'm gonna put this over here for a second. We'll get back to that. 
Um, but let's talk about data collection. Um, so today, what, what, what kind of data do we collect throughout our, you know, throughout our, our lives? Well, you, you know, you've got a cell phone maybe, you've got a, an internet browser, you know, what, what, what's being logged about you, your messages, photos that you upload to Facebook, photos that Google automatically uploads to Google Plus um, and is viewed by Google employees around the world. Um, you know, location data gets, gets logged in general, so when you're using Google Maps, um, your location data gets shared, as with any other service, for whatever reason, they need your location data. I, I don't always understand, like, what, for example, in the last talk, Angry Birds wants my location data for, but, um, so, you know, and, and then basically that data is sent up to a server, it's aggregated in a central spot, and uh, some, like, heavy lifting's done. But this is, you know, you guys already know all this, this is just, this is obvious. So, I posit that soon, we'll be logging everything, that every second of video, audio, your location, IMU data coming off of your various wearable devices will be logged. Now, whether that's in a central repository or in a distributed set of uh, databases, you know, that you control personally uh, is, is yet to be seen, but uh, we will see. Oop, and then Ubuntu. <laughs> oh, God. Um, and so, but I also think that, so it, right now, instead of, instead of this heavy lifting down on a server, we'll start to see a little bit more distributed um, kind of storage of this data as well as processing of this data. So it being sent out to either multiple devices, the, the processing being done right on your device. This is kind of for the data collection where I see things going. Well, okay, what is Google Glass? I, to I took it out. It's an Android phone on your face. This is what Google Glass is. Google Glass is, runs Android 4.0. Um, it's got a, the TI OMAP platform 4430, uh, which is the same if you guys are hardware hackers out there. Pandaboard A1A2 has this, so does the, um, the Samsung Galaxy uh, S2. Uh, it's a very popular platform, and it's kind of maybe not a surprise that, that Google uh, is using it for Glass. Um, and so oh, um, Sarek, who you, you, many of you probably know from Cydia, uh, has a really great write-up, if you haven't seen it already, about uh, exploiting Google Glass. So it, it does come with an OEM Unlock bootloader. However, um, you, know, you, can, you can get around that by just using a security vulnerability, which uh, Sorek demonstrates in the links below. And once again, these are all on the, this, the slides are on the internet, so you can go look at those links later. Um, Oh yeah, and by the way, also this picture is from a tear, a really fantastic teardown by a um, friend of mine, Star Simpson, and her friend um, Scott Torborg, and, and they've got a really fantastic teardown of, tear of Google Glass, and I would recommend you you take a look at that. Just search Catwig on the internet. Um, okay, so let's talk about the performance of Glass. Um, Google Glass has got a, uh, like I said, TI OMAP 4430. That's got a dual core ARM Cortex A9 processor. Um, these are kind of some basic numbers that you'll see uh, with the, both the A9 as well as the uh, SGX 5, ser uh, 5 series that is the, the graphics processing unit on, on Google Glass. So not that much processing power. And so, but yeah, I, I think that over time, like my, we'll see, of course, this stuff all going up. I mean, even the, the modern, some of the modern imagined GPUs get more like 60 or 70 gigaflops, which is pretty impressive for a mobile GPU. Um, and so, you know, th this will come into play later in, in the talk with regards to like what we're doing, what we're doing with this data. Okay, the second one is battery life. Um, you know, it's got a horribly small 587 milliamp hour battery. You know, this is gosh, like a third of what your normal cell phone is. Uh, it, it records video for a whole 60 minutes. Um, and, you know, you can also have it like take pictures regularly if you, if you install some software that I'll talk about later on it. But you get about eight hours of regular use. Once again, this picture is from the teardown. It's, it's a really fantastic teardown. Um, usability, okay, so when you wear Google Glass in public, uh, not only are you shaming yourself, but you have the option to shame yourself even more by talking to it. So you can wear it and, and say, you know, okay, Glass, embarrass me. Em embarrass me. And, 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 you know, they use voice recognition. It's very fancy. 
You can take a picture. This is parodied in media all over the world. Uh, but it is actually really embarrassing to use the voice commands. And, and, and honestly, from a real user experience perspective, it, 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 all joking aside, it is, it's not an ideal interface. If you're sitting on a bus and you're like, OK, you know, send an email or like, send a picture. So you don't want to be talking to your, your face computer. It's, it's bizarre. Um, also, touching it, you have to touch it on the side. You know, the best, the best user interface experience here is on the top there's a button. That's the best. You just tap it once for, to take a picture. That's actually really nice. I like that. Let's, let's keep it there without talking to it. But anyways, that's just, OK, that's an overview of Glass. That's boring. OK, let's talk about the fun stuff. Um, OK, so. Um, As you may or may not know, um, Google Glass comes with their own proprietary launcher called Glass.app, or Glass.app, or something like this. And um, you know, you can scroll through cards and do these these interesting things. But you, you know, when you install a new uh, APK, unlike on a traditional Android platform, it would show up in your launcher, right? No, 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 no. So you can't install, you're not supposed to install apps on Google Glass that way. Um, and so in order to do this in a way that's actually convenient, you need to you either write your own launcher or download one off the internet. I, I made one called Railgun. I'll make all the source available later. You can, if you could check back on, on, on the, um, either the GitHub or the, um, the slides, I'll, I'll have links to all, the, all this code. Um, I'll, I'll tell you which ones have code and which ones don't. But you'll be able to load this onto your Glass or your Android, um, Android phones. Uh, it, this is basically just a, a way for, for once we've installed these interesting APKs to be able to access them. OK, so this is a good one. Google Glass, as you can see here, does not have a hardware recording indicator light. Let's get a round of applause to Google for that. Wow, oh my gosh, what were they thinking? OK, so that's just wonderful. Um, you know, but, but you ask, well, how do you know when you're taking a picture? How do you let others know that you're recording them? Google says, oh, well, the screen turns on when, when, when you're taking a picture. And so this is enforced in software. And as we all know, that's totally not circumventable. Um, so <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the apps that um, I'll post code for later um, is basically this. Uh, it it, it uh, disables the, the video screen. Um, now, I will give it to Google that you do, at least what I've currently found, you know, it, it, this implementation, I, didn't need, to have, I need, didn't need to have root access on the device, which is not hard, obviously, to get. Um, but you know, I did need root access to to actually uh, turn off the the, the, the the display while taking pictures. Um, but you know, yeah. So like, basically, when someone's wearing Google Glass, you actually can't tell if they're recording you or not. Um, now, the only thing that really limits somebody from recording you with Google Glass is really just the battery life. You know, like. <laughs> Uh, so, so Google has actually given you some kind of some kind of a limit there by by making the battery life so poor. Um, so, so that's nice. Um, okay, another one is facial recognition. So, uh, a, a lot of this, um, you know, what I'm going to be talking about is what's possible today, and then kind of saying, okay, well, what's also going to become possible very soon in the near future, um, and. Facial recognition is one of these things that's, that's a, in my opinion, really still a toy application right now. So uh, while it is useful in some contexts, especially if you have, um, let's say, very large amounts of pictures, let's say a wedding photo album, and you need to, let's say, find a, you know, a dozen pictures of, of me, of Stephen, in, in, this app, in this wedding photo album. I'm not married, by the way, but let's say I attended someone's wedding. And, um, it, you know, so that, that's useful for facial recognition. But, you know, the kind of thing where you hear in the media, like, you know, recognize people on the street. This is not, it's just not possible with current technology, with the, the current data sets that we have access to in terms of just, like, widespread mass facial recognition. However, I think that it will become possible very soon 
Um, and it is something that, uh, that, that I've, I've done some work with uh, on glass and, um, you know, uh, is, it, I think it's something that, that is actually, to some degree, going to be very useful. Because you can imagine, you know, wouldn't it be great if, 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 you know, if you're somebody with Alzheimer's or you're blind and, and your wearable device could whisper in your ear the, the name of the person that you're talking to or remind you things about them, or if your pharmaceutical sales rep reminding you know, them what the, this poor psychiatrist's wife's favorite flowers are or whatever, you know. Um, okay, so l let, me, let me show you a little bit of... Uh, data, because this, this is always good to go by example here. Okay, so um, first let me show you just, uh, um, well, with regards to the, the, this, this idea here, so this I'm not posting code for, I have not implemented, I don't plan on implementing this idea. Um, but it's also, this is one of the frightening things, and I think one of the things that is, that is potentially very creepy application. Um, so you can imagine an application that, you know, as you're walking around or driving around, it just uses, you know, uh, you know ANP, ANPR, automated, automated number plate recognition, to pull license plates out of the pictures of what you're, you know, out of what you're seeing, um, parse them out, which is not, it's kind of a solved problem. Like this is a lot easier than facial recognition because it's basically a combination of um, a de-skewing transform and, and then digit and character recognition. So it's kind of like 26 plus 10 classes, right? So it's pretty straightforward um, to classify these license plates. And, um, and then, you know, uploading that number or license plate to a database with GPS location. So like, why would anybody do this? I, I have no idea why anyone would do this, but it's just an example of when you have these, when you start to have always on wearable computers and are collecting massive amounts of data, um, what these, you know, some, some random person could, could create an application like this. It would be pretty straightforward. And uh, let me show you an example of uh, the kind of data you might expect to see. So you'll be able to, you'll be able to see very clearly that, uh, um, Let's see here. Okay. Oh, F11. Okay. So this is just me taking a picture every few seconds. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm revealing. What am I revealing? Okay, I'm reading some article. You know, these are the things that when you do these applications, because I've been, I, you know, I've been logging. Uh, I've, been, I've been kind of doing these experiments and, uh, you know, you realize, oh God, I just logged everything I did on my phone by looking down and, you know, I just, you know, revealed my password by typing it out on my computer, um, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is why I think, you know, or I said earlier in the talk, I think that a lot of this data is going to move from centralized repositories to uh, distributed repositories because I think that the, the Google style We'll upload every photo you take doesn't work when you're automatically logging things. Um, and so, but you, okay, let's see here. Now you think, oh, well, this is not very good resolution. Oh, okay. Let's see here. Um, okay. A can anybody read that license plate number? I can. <laughs> 8199-2H1. Okay. This is somewhere in, uh, on the 101 in, 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 in uh, Silicon Valley. So this is... This is an idea of like what malicious people could do. I'm not malicious, but uh, I am, I guess, curious. And uh, so, you know, we were just driving along. Uh, oh, this, there's another one. Okay, let's see here. I'm sorry, I feel bad. Actually, I don't. I don't feel bad for these people, but I, I do say that, you know, look at this. I mean, it's just the, the sheer amount of data that one can collect is frightening. And I think that this is something that, um, uh, that, that uh, you know, I think it's interesting and, and, and we just don't have a framework for to, you know, to kind of talk about or deal with this from any kind of, you know, legal perspective. Um, because once again, these are all people on public, in public, on public roads. Um, it, it's not clear that, you know, there are some things with regards to uh, driver's uh, privacy. There's some, there's some obscure driver privacy, privacy laws in the United States, but they don't actually apply in this case. Um, so, 
you know, there's just, those, those, those are some of the, um, okay, those are some of the things. Okay, so let's talk about this is low level stuff, and, and, and this is actually, I think, some of the fun stuff for me. So, okay, I, I, show of hands, how many of you have done Android development before? Hopefully a lot. Yeah, good, 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 good. Okay, so you guys will like this part. Um, so let's talk about the code that makes this possible. Um, so you're seeing, you know, I, I, I had it set up where it was taking a picture every few seconds. So that, those, are, those are larger ones. Let me show you... Um, let me show you a, a downsampled, uh, you know, some downsampled stuff uh, of, of an entire day. Uh, okay. So, hopefully, can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, this is, just, this is just me from the beginning of my day uh, I, I, and just starting to take pictures of everything. Now, once again, I've downsized these images. Uh, let me see if I can at least full screen that. Yeah, well, well Fab, by the way, is also the best image viewer. First of all, let's be clear here. Like, look how much faster this is than I have known. Um, anyway, so, you know, you can see, look, this is just a, a picture stream of my entire day. This, this, last, this, this, in, this specific stream lasts from, I think, 11 a.m. to um, 11 p.m. or 12 a.m. Um, and you're wondering, I'll tell you how that's possible in a little bit. Um, but, you know, this is basically the kind of data that I'm collecting every single day. And so you can really kind of get an idea, and I know I'm going really fast here, but let me slow it down. So some nice views, actually. Um, you know, but the, the idea is, like, we're, we're just collecting so much. We're, we're capable of collecting so much data. And, and, and soon in a little bit, I'll talk about how we're capable of processing all of this data. Um, and, and, you know, what does this mean for privacy? What does it mean when... You know, I hold up my phone because I'm sending a text. Let's see what I, what am I doing? Uh, I, I downsized. It looks like we're getting directions somewhere. You know, there's there's a bunch of revealing information, and and uh, we don't we don't even have the, um, you know, God, there, there, I, I think there may be credit cards in there. There's a bunch of horrible things like when you know you're buying something. Oh, look, you accidentally captured your credit card. Um, uh, okay, so let's go back to how this is possible. Um, Okay, full screen. Okay, um, so, so there's a bunch of Android developers here. You're probably familiar with the, the wake lock API. So these are all the different, if you go in the code, uh, you can see this is the, there's an enum somewhere, and this is what, these are the different options. There's partial wake lock, screen dim wake lock, yada, yada, yada. There's even one proximity screen off wake lock, which you may not know about because it's undocumented, which it's just like when you put your face next to an Android phone, it, it um, turns off the screen. Um, that's undocumented, so um, what else here? Yeah, so basically, and this is, this is the API example. Okay, you can get pretty far with this, and, 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 and you know, with, with Google Glass, what you can do is using this, uh, using this, this API, you can, um, you can turn the screen off, and you can continue for some time to continue to take images, right? Uh, so the, this is going back to that secret photo taker. Um, but you'll realize after a short period of time that it gets killed. And you may be wondering, but I set a wake lock. What's going on here? Um, so there's, there's, this, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole slew of... of, of talk and discussion around the Android, uh, um, the, the Android wake lock system that occurred back like a few years ago. Let's see if I have that, yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the people from Android were trying to get this power management system mainlined in the kernel, and people from the Linux were like, get that out of our, get it, get, don't bring that here. And, you know, there's this huge controversy about, like, how are we going to do, how are we going to manage our power? On Android, how can we bring this back into the Linux kernel? There's, there's these things called opportunistic... There, there's this concept of opportunistic suspend. Um, anyways, how you actually go about to, you know, keeping the device running but the screen off is by rooting it and then using the, this, this lower-level power management API that I discussed through the JNI. Um, basically, you remember here, wakelock.acquire. Okay, so what that does, that, that calls a native active suspend blocker, 
And you can trace this, the, the bottom links here, trace throughout the, the Android code base. And then that, that, that calls the native acquires a suspend blocker, which is a JNI call to acquire wake lock, which itself writes to a file descriptor in syspower wake lock, which was that aforementioned controversy on, uh, you know, with the, the Linux kernel and mainlining some stuff from Android. Um, there is a whole hubbub about it. You can read if, you, if, if you're sick. You can read about the technical background of the Android suspend blockers. And man, this poor guy, there's some poor guy from SUS. Uh, I forgot, uh, uh, Raymond. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll go to it later. But uh, this poor guy had to like, oh, OK. This poor guy had to like fight for this one. And it probably shouldn't have been mainlined. Anyways, uh, so. To quote Douglas McIlroy, I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this piece where Donald Knuth proposes web, which is this beautiful literate programming thing, and, and he uses it to implement some kind of word count dictionary thing, and then Douglas McIlroy does a, a very well, well, arti well articulated critique of, of the program and then writes a shell script at the very end that, that does the exact same thing as Donald Knuth's program, which was like a page or two of code. Um, and the quote was, the following shell script was written on the spot and worked on the first try, um, which is the shell script you see down here, which does you know, all, basically everything that this is doing, once you have root access, of course. Um, and so you basically add, you know, write to this file descriptor wake lock. It then allows you to continue to run your camera logging software or whatever you want in the background. Um, OK, so that's just some low-level stuff that hopefully you found I interesting. So the, the, the videos that you were seeing before um, were basically, they, they, were con they were recorded with an Android device. They were not recorded with a glass. I had recorded some similar videos and similar image streams using glass. But as, as I mentioned earlier, the power limitations are just too great. I mean, at the very best, you can get about an hour and a half doing that kind of one picture every four seconds. Um, and so something else was required. Um, and so one of the things that I hacked together was uh, something that, that, that somehow I managed to make something that looks even dorkier than glass. Um, it, it, it was called, it's called Lambda Hat. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, this is the device that I was actually logging that with. Um, it is an Android phone that is, that is strapped to a hat, but um, uh, it has a much larger battery, um, 2,400 milliamp hour battery to be exact, and um, it lasts all day long. I mean, I can record for 16 hours straight, taking a picture every few seconds. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm talking about when I mean the always-on wearable computers. So this is always on, always logging, logging every single thing, um, all of the things. And, and, and it's frightening, to be honest. I've looked at some of this data when I first started again and, and just thought to myself, my god, what have I done? This is a horrible idea. Um, and, and I think it, it, in some ways it is a horrible idea. So that, you know, this, is, this is basically what, what the Lambda hat looks like when, when it's not as geeky. I mean, you can put the board behind the... the this is one of the early prototypes. You can put the board behind the top here. Um, this is not, this is interesting though. I mean, I, 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 have you guys seen the, the new Moto X? And I, you know, it, it is always on and always listening to you. I find that creepy personally. Um, and, and audio data is actually far, far more sensitive than video data. And at least within the, in the United States, we have we have a legal framework that, that represents that in terms of, um, for example, California is a uh, two-party consent state, meaning that Lambda Hat, I couldn't turn the audio recording functions on uh, without telling every single person I talked to, hey, by the way, I'm recording this conversation. Hey, by the way, I'm recording this conversation. However, with video, uh, it's not the same level of protection because it's not the same level of um, uh, invasion. Uh, but, you know, so this is always recording and, you know, only, I, I don't know, I have to see what Google actually does with the data. I don't know if they upload it, but, you know, this is, this is in my opinion, where things are going is always on, not just press a button. It's, it's always on, always listening, and, and Google has also stated this. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about qu quickly processing the, uh, the data that we get. So, 
There's a few different methods that have been used in the past. You guys have all probably heard of neural networks and um, there's been a recent rehash of, uh, of all of this neural network stuff and, and, and basically taking a lot of the same neural networks from the 80s and saying, oh, well, they're bigger and they're deep now. So uh, the, basically this is what the, the trend known as deep learning is. And, and you basically have these hierarchical neural networks that are, that are stacked on top of each other that, um, that are used to represent data. So at the very bottom level, you'll have like an edge detector. Let's say you feed it, um, it structured data of, let's see, from YouTube, for example, which is what was done in, in, in the, the well-known cat detector paper. I don't know, how, how many of you have, have, have heard of the, the cat detector, cat face detector paper? Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah. So, um, so Google and Stanford c collaborated on basically taking a bunch of data from YouTube, training a deep neural network to, uh, um, to, to, to recognize, to, to process this data. And, you know, they, they trained it with like, you know, Google's like, oh, just throw all, throw all the resources at it, 16,000 cores on a thousand machines for three days, I, you know, however much that costs. Um, and it doesn't matter because they make $1.4 billion every month in ad revenue profit. Um, so, you know, basically they achieved state-of-the-art results, and this is um, in 2011. Uh, what you probably haven't heard of, though, and, you know, hopefully, I would assume less than people have heard of the cat detector thing, is that um, some guys from University of Toronto actually reproduced and beat these results on two GPUs. Now, the training time was longer, but two GPUs is well within the financial, uh, financial uh, Resource, you know, well within the, the financial means of, of probably most people in this room. I'm sure you could borrow your friend's GPUs if you needed to. But um, this is what I mean when the, the ability to process this data and the ability to, to, to go through all this data and, and tease out inf interesting things, um, whether that's faces, whether that's license plates, etc., you know, is increasing. And, and everybody is able to do that now, uh, not just large institutions and large organizations. Um, uh, and so, you know, to, to, to Google and Facebook, it's all about selling ads. And so what did Google do when uh, these guys beat them out with the, uh, the GPU implementation? Well, they bought, the, I mean, they aqua hired them. Um, you know, so Jeff Hinton now is part, well, so Jeff Hinton was actually collaborating closely with uh, a lot of the people who were at Google at the time. Um, you know, Jeff Dean and Andrew Ng, uh, they, some, Andrew Ng has since left to, uh, go work on Coursera, but uh, you know, they, had, they had basically their, their deep learning research thing called Google Brain, and um, they, the Google brought on Jeff Hinton's group, who is, Jeff Hinton is, is basically, the, you know, Steve Mann's the godfather of, of wearable computing, Jeff Hinton is certainly the godfather of, uh, of neural networks. Um, and so, you know, so what did Facebook do? Facebook's like, well, I, I don't want to be left out of this, so let's hire, let's hire Jan LeCun, who's the, the, the neural network guy out of NYU, who, who's done a lot of work with, um, uh, with uh, this deep learning stuff as well, and has, has had some really good results on, uh, you know, ha has been spearheading this for a really long time. So, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, Mark Zuckerberg personally attended NIPS, which is like the largest AI machine learning neural network conference, and uh, you know went to hire everybody else. Uh, he he was quoted, you know, he wants to build a theory of mind for every Facebook user. Um, I, I don't know what that means, to be honest. I'm pretty sure I don't want it though. Um, it, it doesn't sound like it's something that I want. Um, You know, and it's always hard to tell whether this is, you know, is this him like, oh, let's do some lofty goal that, that will hire a bunch of people so we can keep them away from Google, or is this actually like some master plan? It's, it's never clear, um, but, you know, I, I don't know. So, and once again, let's be clear, it's all about selling ads. Like, Google makes $15 billion in profit every year from selling click ads, like, it's a big business. If they, can sh if they can get an extra few percentage points off of their click-through rates and off of their ability to target, like, that's what, this is what it's all about. So let, let's be clear about what, you know, why they're interested in this stuff. 
Uh, and you're thinking, well, wait, should we be worried? And so this, this is going on to the privacy part of things. You know, we have this new technology that enables us to gather, archive, and process data about ourselves and others. So remember, I'm just like logging data of like these poor people driving down the 101, like never before. So this is, this is, this has never happened before, right? Okay, so maybe. Um, now, this is an interesting quote. So, instantaneous photographs in newspaper enterprise have invaded the sacred precincts of private and domestic life, and numerous mechanical devices threaten to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. So this is a quote from a really amazing law review article called The Right to Privacy, which was published in 1890 by Warren and Brandeis. Um, Brandeis w went on to become um, a Supreme Court justice, and uh, this, uh, the right to privacy kind of enshrined in, um, in, in American law this, this concept of a right to privacy. Um, and it, it, you know, this, this, this is a really famous article. And what was this in response to? So this was in response to instantaneous photography. Okay, so around the same time, what had been invented, why not the Kodak Brownie camera? This first made available to everyone the ability to log images easily, relatively inexpensively, and capture that moment for eternity. And so this was a whole new thing. It caused a lot of controversy back in the day, 1890s, oh, you know, um, about 100, over 120 years ago. And, uh, and, and so that's the brownie. So the question is, are these devices, are these always on wearable computers that are logging and watching everything? You know, you can probably even throw up on there um, Facebook and these social networks, although uh, they, are, they are different in that you voluntarily broadcast data, which you can voluntarily opt out of in some ways. But you know, with these devices, if I'm walking on the street, I can't opt out of someone looking at me and then recording that. You know, there's just no way for me to do that right now, and, you know, other than you know, probably doing something bad. Um, so, you know, are these neo-brownies? That's a question that, that I, I pose to everybody in this audience. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how similar uh, this is. To me, there's definitely some parallels. There are other things that are not similar. Um, and uh, it's, just, it's just kind of something to keep in mind. And so, uh, um, yeah, so that concludes the talk portion. And I'd love to uh, put a, 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 some portion of time away for for questions, so hopefully we can get those started too, if you guys have any. Okay, so. We have four mics, there are two and there are two more, so just line up there if you have questions. You can also use ISC and Twitter. So, internet, anything? Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, how many questions? Uh, first one is, uh, are there any countermeasures to be taken against possible violation of your privacy? Uh, for, ex for example, scramble suits or government orchestrated daily license plate rotation or something? Um, so, you know, it, it really depends on what you're trying to circumvent. Uh, uh, a lot of these, these CMOS-based cameras uh, you know, they have IR filters, but I I've seen examples of things where if you wear very bright IR lights, you can scramble some of, uh, you know, some, some kind of off-the-shelf cameras. Um, uh, in terms of license plate stuff, I don't know what could be implemented there. Like you said, maybe rotation or um, some... It, it, it's really, it's hard. And, you know, basically each one of these solutions need to be, needs to be come up with on a, on a, on a uh, problem by problem basis to like solve that specific problem. Um, you know, uh, some people have proposed these like ridiculous like LED lights that you wear in your face. I think that's, I, I don't think that's a solution. Anything that someone's not gonna wear isn't a solution. Um, I, I don't have all the solutions for you. So, I, uh, but there, there are, there exists some out there. Um, I think some of the other things like the, uh, 
the anti Viola Jones uh, like makeup stuff is, is is a great marketing thing. I'm not sure if it's like realistic or useful. I mean, honestly, the the state of the art of face recognition and detection is such that like if you you know wear a hat and like look down, you're going to be doing pretty well, just like you would you know stopping someone from doing face recognition if there were a person standing up there and if I was you know walking on the street going like this, it'd be a little bit hard to for, to, to see me. Uh, so just Kind of the same things that you do anyways, I guess. I don't know, any other, what was your next question you said? Number one, please. Okay. Um, since you bashed uh, Google a little bit at the beginning, um, do you think the uh, recording LED will uh, do any better since uh, three or four days ago? Um, a paper comes out about uh, MacBooks, which uh, firmwares you can rewrite so the LEDs don't go on if you uh, turn on the camera. Hmm. Yeah, so um, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, I think there is a difference to, I mean, right, it's always about like the difficulty of circumventing something, right? So, I mean, obviously I could desolder the LED, right? And, and so if I'm just going to go in and desolder the LED, uh, you know, that, that would be a good solution to not keeping the, 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 the light on. Now, obviously, um, the, the, the worry is that, uh, you know, at least with the MacBook thing, in my opinion, is probably that this is done remotely. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, so, I mean, to, to answer your question, uh, no, no, I, I, does, did, did Google deserve that bashing? I don't know, you know, honestly, if it's as easy as rooting the device and like that's all you need to do versus install for, I still think that's probably an issue compared to, uh, at least to, to make the claim, oh no, it's fine, the, the display comes on. Like a software thing is definitely very different than like some kind of semi-obscure firmware, uh, firmware changes, in okay. my opinion. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Internet? Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, next question is, uh, is your laptop at on right now? Are you recording pictures? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. So that's a good, a good question, and the answer is no. Uh, this, this, this one is actually just a, uh, uh, this is a, just a shell right now. It doesn't have a battery on. Number four, please. So assuming Google Glass is using that small battery due to weight concerns, how much does your Lambda head weigh? Um, the, the Lambda hat weighs more because it has a bigger battery, but uh, it, the weight is distributed evenly throughout my head, so it's actually far more comfortable and feels kind of just like a normal hat. Three. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned the uh, always-on uh, recording LED and stuff like that. Um, do you think that it is a solution or can be part of the solution to uh, have um, the vendors who build this stuff uh, implement things like always on indicators for recording when on the same time we usually don't want uh, that the devices that we own behave uh, outside our own control. For example, if I have a phone and then I think I should be the one to decide when the LED is on or off as the same on my laptop, the problem is only that I can't trust the software on it. But uh, I think there, the, the cure would be kind of difficult if you say that vendors should ensure this stuff. Um, okay, so uh, to be clear about you know what my personal stance is versus what you know an ideal solution is, I actually kind of uh, agree. And, and you know, I, I did bash Google, but um, uh, I, I I personally think that you're, at the end of the day, if someone's going to circumvent it. Um, they're gonna like, and they're gonna do something malicious with it. They're gonna be able to circumvent it, and like, if there's a hardware LED, they'll be able to desolder it and like make it totally private. And I think that probably that is your right as the device owner. I, I personally, there's the only thing I hate hate, hate more than people. Uh, probably surreptitiously recording is uh, people uh, trying to tell me what I can and cannot do. And so, you know, if I bash Google, Google, I like Google, but I, I hate authority figures that tell us what we can and cannot do. And I think that's what Google has tried to be with, with some of their devices. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. It was kind of ranty, sorry. Uh, um, but, but yeah, no, I, I personally think the number one way is that you have control over your device, um, even if that's secondary to 
uh, the privacy of others. Okay, internet, go ahead. Uh, the internet would like to know oh, if you are selling your Lambda ads or if you have plans to have a Kickstarter or something. Um, uh, so I, I'm actually, after I, after I come back, I'm going to be flying out to, uh, to China after, after this, and uh, we're going to be uh, working with some manufacturers there. So coming soon, uh, we personally, I, I, I want to avoid the kind of like vaporware Kickstarter, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you have invested in Kickstarters that never actually ended, ended up doing anything. And so uh, we're going to actually try and make, a, a f make something before taking other people's money. <laughs> Okay. Number one. So, uh, as you've said, uh, Google Glass looks a bit dorky and the usability is still awkward. Uh, do you think it will gain uh, traction in the mainstream in the next couple of years? Or uh, maybe it is a novelty item which uh, is a problem that will solve itself? Um, hmm. that's, uh, that's a hard question to, you know, in terms of like, <clears throat> I'm not a prophet, but I have some ideas about it and I have thought about it for a while. So. Um, one, if you guys remember back in the day, PDAs, those took off for a while. You know, there was like the, the Palm Pilot 5, and you know, I had it when I was a kid. I was really cool with my PDA, and uh, those took off well before smartphones hit the mass market. You know, there was the Trio, right? The Trio did everything an iPhone does. It just did it in a way that was kind of not right, and uh, it wasn't until probably, you know, iPhone and Android hit the market that... Uh, that smartphones took off. So um, I would probably argue that Google Glass is maybe more in the PDA stage than the iPhone stage. Although Google probably wants it to be like the iPhone. I, I probably don't think it is. So novelty. Okay, internet. Uh, next, question, next question from the internet is, uh, what about something like Tower LAFS for storage uh, so you can control your logged data? Uh, sorry, what was the first part? I heard Tahoe LAFS. Yes. But is uh, that what you said? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, by the way, everyone else, Tahoe Lease Authority File System is a distributed uh, file system that's um, actually developed by a guy, Zuko, uh, who frequents Noise Bridge, my local hacker space, got a rep. And um, uh, so I think that's interesting, and I also think so that's a really good statement. I think that the other interesting thing is, what if not only was the storage distributed in a secure manner, what if the processing could also be distributed in a secure manner? So you could get kind of like supercomputer-like processing power over a bunch of different devices. I think that would be interesting too. So, yes. Is anyone else in the room who wants to ask a question? Maybe you can't stand up, then we will probably bring you a mic. Okay, internet. Okay. Okay, uh, we still have a bunch of questions from the internet. The next one is, uh, do you think such device will one day be central part of our life? And uh, if you know, if there are glass-like projects that are completely open, uh, so you have control of your data, and uh, if you don't know of any other such project, do you know what will prevent this project from existing? Um. So, well, I mean, I would like to say, you know, I'd like to say that in general, like, for example, Lambda Hat is going to be open, but, um, you know, I, I don't know any other companies that, like, have a super open mentality with regards to their wearable devices. Yes, I personally think that a wearable computer is going to be a central part of, of our lives in the future, just like your mobile devices. Um, and then even may, you know, supplant your mobile device or be your mobile device. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but uh, I do think that, that an always-on wearable device or always-on computer that you keep on your body is, always, is going to be a central feature of your life in the, in the future. Okay, just continue. Okay, uh, next question is, what are your thoughts on narrative clip, previously Memoto, assuming you know what it yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so... I think it's interesting. It's microcontroller based, so uh, what that means is that it's not really programmable as easily as a system on a chip. I would, I would have preferred the device to be system on a chip. Obviously, you get memory, or sorry, not memory, but um, uh, battery life improvements by making it a microcontroller based system. Um, 
interesting. I've never actually touched one before. I've looked at it. Uh, I, I think that you know, the reality is that that's li it's a life-logging device, whereas I think that the really interesting things are the you know, more general purpose computers. And so I think the, 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 if it, 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 to be interesting, I, I think you need to be able to SSH into it. <laughs> yeah, just continue. Um, yeah, the, I cannot really make sense of these questions, so I will just read them. Uh, if you can make sense and swear, it is good. Uh, so the similarities between brownies and Google Glass are quite obvious. Uh, Google Glass goes even further with processing data automatically. Where do you see the difference since the brownies were only capable of taking the pictures locally? Wait, brownies? The, I think that's the... Oh, brownies. The, oh, brownies. Yeah, okay, sorry. okay. I heard brownies, which is like male fans of the I, uh, you know, My Little Pony thing. Um, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> um, okay, brownies, yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, so I mean, like I said, I mean, uh, technology improves it, and yeah, sure, is this like, is this like a brownie that broadcasts to the internet? Uh, yes, yes it is, but that's, we, you know, we've had that for a while. Um, uh, so, um, I, I still think that they're similar in, in, in okay. the so debate there, that, they're, that they're bringing okay. up. Um, and I, like so, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. I think we're probably... No, no. We have 10 more minutes left. Okay. I don't know why everybody's okay. leaving. Um, well. Number three, please. Um, I have a question. Um, you earlier said uh, that uh, Google does, doesn't want to store all the pictures on their server so uh, they, can, uh, they will be stored on our computers. Um, can you explain that again uh, or more details about that? Because I think Google is still interested in gathering all the information that Google can get. Oh, uh, oh I'm definitely not suggesting that Google's going to want to uh, ha keep these things on uh, your, 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 your own device. I mean, I, I'm thinking that the users would probably want to end up keeping their life you know, streams on their own device. Uh, Google is going to still probably go the Google Plus auto upload route. Uh, so no, I wasn't suggesting that Google is going to want to promote doing distributed storage of data. They're about centralizing and, and, and uh, exerting monopoly power over data. OK, thank you. Number four. Yes. Um, I, I would like to come uh, back to the, to the brownie uh, aspect and parallel because the, at the time, um, Kodak uh, didn't want to sell cameras, but the process. And the ad said, um, you push the button, we do the rest. And you talked about the Google Glasses as a capture uh, device and not as a process one, and not also as a, um, as a restitution one. And what, what uh, are you interested in the, the restitutions? Uh, of the image, so for example, when we see a face, it, tell, it, it can also distort the reality and present us an image that, that isn't the reality we see, but a process one or anything else. So, um, it, what, what was the exact question? It, do, what, what I uh, yeah, the, the, no, the question was, um, you, it, it just, just not yeah. really a question, you just have to, your point of view, on okay. this aspect of the Google Glasses. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, we don't see reality, but gotcha, another aspect, gotcha. processes by Google. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, yeah, so that's the augmented reality side of things, right? Um, Google Glass is not an augmented reality device. Uh, it, it's a device that allows you to do push notifications, basically small little updates you can't overlay on reality. Um, and so that's not what Google Glass is. Guy, I, the battery life would be even worse if, if, if it was. Uh, the, the field of view on the display isn't large enough. Um, and so it, it, it's not, Google Glass is not an augmented reality device. But uh, yeah, so there, there are definitely some things that you can do to do processing on, on Glass, but uh, it's definitely, that's not its core principle, is, to, is, not, is not to do augmented reality. And I think we're, we're probably a little bit farther off from that augmented reality dream that uh, you know, we'd all love to see. Number three. Uh, okay, I'm with the Pirate Party of the Netherlands, so I'm uh, very uh, interested in the legislative side of things yeah. um, uh, regarding privacy. Um, and I'm really interested to know, um, uh, from a guy like you, what would you propose um, 
for um, uh, what kind of legislation would you s propose to limit uh, privacy violations by these kinds of devices? Um, and do you think legislative processes will even work to, you know, limit privacy violations? Yeah, so um, I think that the, 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 the one thing that, that worries me more than uh, the rogue person on the street uh, surreptitiously f f taking photos and, and doing creepy things is uh, draconian government regulation and policy. Uh, just because, guys, <laughs> it's like, I, I can't even imagine that, that they would even be able to come up with uh, some kind of something that's reasonable and implemented in a reasonable way and not have it be influenced by moneyed powers. I, I just, uh, I, I personally, uh, you know, within the United States, and, you know, we don't have a pirate party that's uh, mm -hmm. an active choice in the United States, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I personally, from in the United States, I would worry about a legislative solution just because uh, I've seen a lot of those and they, they always seem to cause nasty side effects. Yeah, if you were to propose a legislative uh, a solution, just to just propose that someone yeah. would ask you literally, um, what should I put in this law? Um, um, what would you say um, to uh, limit uh, privacy violations? Hmm. Well, so there's two things, right? Because there's the there's both the right to not be photographed, but there's also the right to photograph. So, mm -hmm. so um, uh, basically, the you know the, the the fundamental question is, you're asking me where do I personally draw the line, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, and and then and then basically saying, you know, what does my opinion have to have to do with then, like why why should that be projected out onto society, or you know, I guess you're saying asking me to make that legislative deci decision. Um, I, honestly, uh, that's, that's um, it's a very complicated <laughs> th thing to answer and I, 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 pro I don't feel comfortable coming up with like a legislative solution on the spot. Mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to know what a guy like you who hacks Android devices might say. About uh, okay, so you know, if I'm just going to choose yeah. one, let me. Yeah. I, I will just choose. Uh, uh, if people are going to do something like th like this, it, it's relatively easy to record people on the street, and it, you know, some people will choose to do that. And if, if you know, I, I would say let's not make it illegal to record people on the street. So I would say I would go more towards the uh, photographer's rights than the person walking along on the street because there are there exist countermeasures. You can, for example, um, you know, uh, wear a you know wear some kind of mask or a hoodie or a uh, a hat. You know, there there are things that you can do um, versus um, you know there there it, there's. I guess there's, you know, there's etiquette as well, you, for, as from the photographer's perspective, yeah. um, which we, we have today anyways. Um, I, I, I just in general would say, let's kind, of, let's kind of try and put this into the format that we currently have, which is let's have good etiquette and good um, uh, you know, things but that are not like uh, legally enforced. I, I think we already have pretty good solutions to these problems. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one last question from the internet. Okay, uh, just a note first, this apparently one of the people in IRC uh, has worked with Steve Mann and is relaying an idea Steve Mann was developing was, uh, and when you say the Google Glass are probably not the right device for this kind of thing, but you could have a, a real life ad block, like, you know, blocking billboards in the street or replacing them with nice painting or something. Uh, so, yeah, that's a nice idea, I think. And the actual question here is uh, completely unrelated. What is the state of the bootloader? Uh, you said there was a vulnerability that allows unlocking it. Uh, uh, how does that work? Or, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so what I was referencing was Sarek has a really wonderful write-up on um, uh, using a security vulnerability to, um, to root your Google Glass. Um, you can, so, it comes OEM unlocked. The bootloader comes OEM unlocked. So you can just do uh, fast boot OEM unlock, you know, fast boot unlock, and it'll unlock the device. However, as Sark points out in his article, uh, if you decide to relock that device later, it doesn't. The flag doesn't get set to locked. It gets set to relocked. So you know you could be violating your warranty. Not to mention, it's a bad idea to keep like an unlocked bootloader. Um, 
you know, because someone could just like plug something in, reflash your operating system. From a security perspective, it's a bad idea. Um, uh, but you know, so there's both the the the, the Google sanctioned route, which is fast, fast boot OEM unlock, and there's the uh, vul security vulnerability route, which is uh, just using a security vulnerability to gain root access. It um, and so I don't know if that answers the question, but th that's the state of the bootloader. Okay, so we are out of time. Please thank Stephen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>